Let me read this to you before we start. Another testimony of what happens. Uh, you know, we have two dream centers, two outreach centers, one in Decatur, one in Lawrence County. Uh, Pastor Emilio Sanchez is our director of our Decatur Dream Center. He, he, he tells me, Pastor, yesterday, we, look at this. You know, I believe as God, as we're obedient in giving, God blesses us in what we do. And because of someone giving to the Dream Center, listen to this. Yesterday at the Decatur Dream Center, uh, the Adopt a Block Ministry gave away over $1,000 in free milk to families yesterday. Come on, let's thank God for that. That's a perishable item that usually doesn't happen. $1,000 of free milk given away, one person saved, two people healed. Come on, what a great adopt a block. This happens every first and third Saturday. There's a place for you to get involved. And Brody, have you got the picture? You can, you can, we can change the victimization. We've been healed and delivered from victimization. So we're, we're on to something else this month. Hey, look at this. I don't know if you can see the little lady. You can see, of course, this was served the city. We can see the little lady right in the middle there that we're all surrounding. That's Miss Betty. Miss Betty uh, it comes to Calvary. The, uh, she's we, one of our ladies we met through our outreach ministries. And we, she, uh, back during the summer when we were doing Serve the City, uh, she sent a message to us that she'd be diagnosed with the late stages of cancer. But she said, Pastor, uh, we, she goes to our Dream Center. She also was coming on Sunday morning in the 11 o'clock service. Uh, uh, Jimmy and Debbie Lucky run uh, a people mover and bring some folks in. And uh, Miss Betty was diagnosed with the late stages of cancer. And she called us and said, Pastor, I've, I've been praying. And God has spoken to me several times. She said, if I obey him in a couple areas, there are certain, he's told me to have prayer and, and, and told her what to do. He said, she, God told her that she was going to be healed of cancer. Well, this is back in the summer. You see Miss Betty there in the middle. Well, I got some good news for you. We got the report from her doctor this week that she's cancer free. <laughs> cancer free. Amazing answer to prayer. Cancer free. So just one of the other things happening through our outreaches and our adopt the block ministry, I'm going to tell you, it's amazing the things that God is doing. So we're excited. Thank God for that. Well, I want to begin a series today for this month called this, uh, I've entitled this series, The Spirit of Thanksgiving. The Spirit of Thanksgiving. I'm excited about sharing this with you. Uh, this series is about more than a holiday, okay? This is not just about Turkey Day, all right? The, the, the spirit of Thanksgiving, uh, it's, it's more than a holiday, but if you'll think about what's going on in our society today, it is a picture of what's happening in our lives. If, if, if you've noticed, uh, the buildup to Halloween every year is greater and greater. I think there are more people in my neighborhood celebrating Halloween than Christmas. It's crazy. I'm at orange lights and witches and goblins and ghosts. And when I was a little kid, the little children dressed up. Now everybody's got a costume. And, and you know, there's they're more Halloween stuff. So Halloween, big, 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 big. Everywhere you go, all the stores, Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. And the day after Halloween, it's Merry Christmas. I mean, am I right? I mean, the day after Christmas trees and Santa Claus. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's crazy. We, went, we go straight from Halloween to Christmas. And it's just like Thanksgiving has been forgotten, even in the holidays. I guess, you know, uh, that it's, it's not easy to monetize, and that's how our culture looks at everything, Thanksgiving. You just can't make as much money off Thanksgiving as you can off Halloween and Christmas. And so it's just been forgotten. But that picture, and again, this series I want to teach you is much more important than just a holiday. One day when we, you know, have a meal, I want to talk about our concept of giving thanks to God, the place of giving thanks to God in our life. I believe that what we see happening, like, like I said, in, 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 in our stores, Halloween to Christmas, no Thanksgiving, is happening in the life of God's people all too often. And because of that, we, we are missing some major moments God has for us. So what I want to do beginning today is just unpack the power and the place of giving thanks in the life of a believer. I believe it's something that we've let slip. There, there is so much about thanksgiving, giving thanks to God that keeps us in step with God's will for our life. If, if we lose thanksgiving in our life, we're, we're going to begin to get out of step with the Holy Spirit. We're going to begin to miss some important 
encounters God has for us. Without giving thanks in our life, there are some preordained intersections between you and God that you will miss. There are moments that God would visit us that we forfeit if we allow the circumstances of our life to steal the thankful heart out of us. Uh, it, it, it's, 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 as we read and I'll show you today, that giving thanks to God is one of the greatest opportunities to release faith and hope in your life when you need it the most. And so it's so important we understand this. Again, uh, it, it's hard for us when I say Thanksgiving not to think about a day. I'm talking about an attitude, about a journey, about a key element of your life as a Christian. I, I'll tell you this. I have never met an overcoming Christian, a strong, growing Christian that did not have giving thanks as a regular part of their life. If we lose that element, we forfeit some of the most important moments God has for us. So I, wanna, I want to uh, look at, uh, I'm going to ask you a question three times today in, in this message, all right? I want to begin here, and let's look in Luke 17 and verse 11, a familiar passage, but, but these, these areas I want to teach you today have some powerful hidden truth connected to giving thanks to God, all right? Let's, let's begin, follow along with me, Luke 17 verse 11. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. Notice, they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice because they were quite a distance away from him by law. And they said, verse 13, in a loud voice, Jesus Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. Why was that? Under Jewish law, if you had contracted leprosy and you wanted to enter back into society, they could not live with people. They had to live in, in their own villages. They were solitary people or only around other lepers. They could not touch anyone. They could not live in a home. They could not live in a city. And the only way they could come back into society was go to the priest and he would verify their healing. So he says, go, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Verse 15, one of them, someone say one. One, one of them. When he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. Oh, I could preach on that. As our voice is loud when we're thanking him as it is when we're asking him for the help. <laughs> a lot of people real loud on, that, on the help question, but not so loud on the thank you part. Come on. Huh? Uh, boy, when, when we're in trouble, we can pray, can't we? When we're in trouble, we can call on the Lord. When we've got leprosy, we're loud. Jesus, Jesus, have mercy. But then he heals and we lose our voice. That's, that's not my message, but let's keep going. So he was praising him as loud as he was praying to him. Come on. So he threw himself at Jesus' feet, and what did he do? And thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Now watch this. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So, so what are we seeing here? I, I, I want to go back and, and we're going to lead ourselves up to this, but I want to go to verse 15 again. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back. So my question today is who came back? Who came back? That's, that's what we need to ask ourselves. Have I come back? Do I go back? Who came back? Let's look at this again. Let's look in verse 11 for a moment and make sure we understand this passage that we're studying here. I think this is so insightful. I want you to see this. Verse 11, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Now I've taught you before that the Samaritans were the outcasts of that day. The Samaritans were those people who had intermarried with the Jews and Gentiles. The Jews abhorred them. 
The Jews would not touch them. The Jews would not enter Samaria. They were considered unclean people. They were rejected. They, they were looked down upon. They were avoided at all costs. And isn't it interesting that this is not the first time that we read about Jesus going where other people refuse to go? I am thankful that the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus someone tries to paint for us, is a God who loves the outcast, who loves the forgotten, who will go where religious people won't go, who will go where political people won't go, who will do will go and bring the love of God. I thank God we serve a Savior who's not afraid to go places other people are afraid of. He's right there on the border. And then it says that as he's going through the border, uh, what, what is the border? Between Samaria and Galilee. Here's the other thing about Jesus. Come on, we're supposed to be like him, right? Right. I, we're like him, right? So we love people other people don't love. We go places other people won't go. And you know what else? He's on the border, look at this, between Samaria and Galilee. Jesus is the great connector of the things that divide us without him. Come on, you understand that? Jesus says, I'm not a Samaritan or a Galilean or a Jew. I'm a follower of my Father God. So I'm not only going to go where others don't go. I'm going to connect people that others want to separate. The mark of a Christian, listen, in our culture today, we need this. It's not who we disagree with, but how we've been able to connect people that others say cannot be brought together. That's the DNA of this church. We are in this church bringing people together that other people are wanting to divide. See, we are about connecting, not dividing. God works in connections and Satan works in the gaps. You will not hear messages, preaching, teaching, or lifestyle out of this church that divides us. We will declare the word of God that brings us together. We will connect on the highest level. Come on, how many are with me today? So if you want to divide, this is not the place to go. If you want to connect, this is it. Why? That's what Jesus does. So verse 12, as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out, Jesus, have pity on us. One translation, many translations say, have mercy, Jesus. Mercy is a unique word. I've defined it for you before. Mercy is something I desperately need, but I do not deserve. Do you know that you can go to God not on the basis of what you've done, but on the basis of who he is? How many are thankful for that today? They, they, they didn't say, you owe me. They didn't say, I deserve it. They said, I need it. I need it. I need it. Lord, I don't deserve it, but I need it. Aren't you thankful today that, that, that mercy is all we can plead before God sometimes? So they said, Lord, have mercy. So we read that when he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now, let, here's, here's where we're, we're, we're going to learn something about giving thanks, the spirit of thanksgiving. Uh, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice, threw himself at Jesus' feet, thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. You see, he, he came back. Uh, you know, what we use this term when, when it looks hopeless and, and, and we're about to lose and, 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 you know, it's football season and, and, and I think if any of you watched Auburn yesterday, then you, and, and, and Texas A&M, that you can relate to a comeback. I mean, every once in a while in a football game, it looks hopeless. Huh? I mean, they're going to lose. The, the, the bandwagon fans have already started leaving the stadium. Come on. You, you, you know what I'm talking about? Nick Saban's mad at them because they're leaving early. And I know that's, so I had to throw in an Alabama plug for Auburn. Okay. So I, I get he's not the Auburn coach. So, but but there, those are moments, you know, like, like Miss Betty, when the doctor says, and the doctors are good. How many are thankful for a doctor? I'm thank God for a doctor. Thank God for our doctor. The doctors that have been in Phoenix life have been gifts from God to us. I pray over them and bless them. But, but all the doctor could do is tell Miss Betty what he saw. He said, Miss Betty, it doesn't look good. You know, I don't know what you can do. But some, that, that's, that's when you need to come back. When everybody's counted you out and you just come back. Somebody said it this way. You know, what the devil tr tried to do is a setback 
It was just a setup for God to give you a comeback. Come on, how many are thankful that the devil tried to give you a setback, but it was just a setup for your comeback. So when you had a comeback, how many have ever had a comeback? See, if you've ever had a comeback, a God-given comeback, watch me, then you need to come back to him and say, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you've done. Ten people healed. Nine went on their way. And one said, excuse me, I've got to come back. I need to take care of some business. I need to thank him. I need to say, God, thank you for what you've done. You come back to the one who's worthy. That's what we were doing this morning when we begin to sing that song. You know, thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying. What are we saying? We're saying, Lord, I want to just hit pause. And I want to come back to the one who saved me, the one who loved me, the one who changed my life. And I want to thank you. When you give thanks to God, you are recognizing you're the one who made this difference in my life. See, and so uh, it's, that's what Thanksgiving is. Thanksgiving is a comeback. It's, it's when we say, I, I know everybody's running down the road, but I, go ahead. I want to stop and give some thanks to God. I want to take some time to remember what God has done. And give him glory. In fact, look at verse 17 again. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Do you realize the question Jesus had? God expects us to give thanks to him. It's abnormal for a believer not to be thankful. Jesus said, what happened? Where are they? Well, well, what did they do? What, th that's not how we're supposed to respond. The expectation of heaven is that you and I come back and say, God, I just want to thank you. God, I want to take some time and I, and I want to be thankful. But I want you to see this. I don't want you to miss this. L look, at, look at verse 19. By the way, giving thanks will turn a foreigner into a family member. Come on. He said, see, you want to start moving from being a foreigner. He said, only the foreigner? Only the Samaritan? Only the outcast came back. He said, well, he's not a foreign anymore. He's in the family. You start giving thanks and you move past. Watch this. Thanksgiving will break down every barrier that man has put on you and bring you right back into the presence of God. But here's what I want you to see. Look at verse 19. This is only spoken to the thankful person. This is only spoken to the one who comes back, who takes some time, who doesn't just receive the blessing and just run on down the street. What does he say? Your rise and go, he fell at his feet. He said, rise and go, your faith has made you whole. Thanksgiving to God is evidence of faith in God. The fact that you're giving thanks is the evidence that you have faith. And not only evidence that faith is present, but it releases faith in your life. You're going to begin to see that when you give thanks, it releases faith. When you thank God, your faith begins to be built. Remember, I've taught you that when you give a testimony, the, the part, one of the inflections of the biblical languages for the word testimony has, has the connotation of doing it again. When somebody gives a testimony of what God has done, the same anointing that created the original miracle is released in that moment and God can do it again. So the power of a testimony is not only saying this is what the Lord has done, it's releasing that presence to do the same thing again. And when you begin to give thanks, are you with me? When you begin to thank God, the same faith that created your answer to prayer, your miracle, your breakthrough initially is released back in your life when you start giving thanks to God. We say, God, thank you. Faith begins to be released. But here's what I want you to see. Notice what Jesus said. Your faith has made you whole. See, this word whole, listen to it's It's the Greek word sozo. It's the word translated save most often in the New Testament. Where the Bible says Jesus came to seek and to save those that were lost. It's this word. And this word sozo, this Greek word where he said this is the blessing that the one who came back received. Are you with me? The other nine didn't get this. Ten were healed physically, but one received something else because he thanked God. Sozo, listen, to save, to heal, to cure, to preserve, to keep safe and sound, to rescue from danger or destruction. In physical death, 
you're saved by healing. Are you ready? But from spiritual death, this word says, you are forgiven and the effects of your sins are canceled. Some of the ancient cultures translated this word to give a new life or to cause to have a new heart. So watch this. The nine ungrateful received a physical touch. But the one thankful man not only was healed physically, but received a brand new life that day. You see, the nine ungrateful received one touch from Jesus, but the thankful man received fellowship from Jesus. See, his life was changed. There's, I've seen people healed physically, but they weren't changed spiritually. They received, they had a touch, but they didn't have a transformation. See, a lot of people never get by that. They just want God to touch them. They just want a treatment. Anybody listening to me? They just want to come to church and get a touch, get a blessing, get a treatment. But the person that will come back to God when he has done something and say, I just want to thank you. I just want to come to your feet and take some time and give you thanks. Jesus said, I see your faith and you're not only healed physically, you're healed, saved, blessed spiritually. You've got a new life. When I walk away from the presence of Jesus, I want more than a blessing. I want an encounter with him. I want to walk off with a life that's been transformed by the presence of God. Anybody who with me on this today. See, this, this is what happens. Only the thankful receive a new life from him. So who came back? See what happens? Thanksgiving is the second time around. Thanksgiving is when you say, you know, I'm thankful for what you've done, but I love who you are. I want to honor you. I want to say thank you. A Christian that loses the attitude of thankfulness is a person who begins to lose gratitude and blessing in their life. It's a person who loses focus about who God is and what he's doing. Let, let me show you another person who came back. Let's go to John chapter 12. John the 12th chapter. And, and uh, let's go to verse number 1. John 12, 1. You with me there? Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived in Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. All right? You remember that account. It was in the previous chapter, John 11. Uh, this, this same account is, is given in Matthew and Mark and John. There's an account in Luke 11 of a woman coming and, 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 and with a box of, of perfume and pouring that out on him. It's not the same as this one. That's a, that was a sinful woman. A woman who had come out of a sinful lifestyle and her life had been changed. That, that's a separate account. It's a different time in his ministry. But, but in, in, in Matthew, Mark, and John, we read about a person here. And, and her name is given here. In, in John. So six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Verse 2. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha, you remember Martha, that's Lazarus' sister, served. She's still doing what Martha does. While Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with them. Then Mary, that's Lazarus' other sister, is doing what Mary does, took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. A dinner was given in his honor. Now, Matthew and Mark tell us that the dinner was in the house of a man known as Simon the leper. Now, you have to understand that if he was still a leper, he couldn't be in the house. If he was still a leper, he wouldn't be having dinner. So somewhere, I don't know if it's the one we just read about, but Jesus had encountered this man named Simon who lived in the city of Bethany who was dying of leprosy and healed him. And this man's life is restored. And so he sends a message to Jesus and says, I'm so thankful. I want you to come to my house. We need to celebrate what you've done. And, and, and he invited over Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And Lazarus and Mary and Martha said, yeah, we want to come because we want to come back around and thank Jesus for what he's done. What they were having was a celebration 
party. They, they were literally coming in and God was about to do something so powerful and so amazing. They were giving thanks to the goodness of God. What, what, you know, it was a comeback party. How many heard what I said? In other words, they, everybody, Lazarus, are you thankful that he raised you from the dead? He said, I, yeah, I'm thankful. Mary and Martha, are you thankful that he raised your brother from the dead? We're thankful. Simon, the ex-leper, are you thankful? He said, you know what we need to do? Let's just have a comeback party. Let's just have a Thanksgiving celebration. See, long before the pilgrims came to America and the Indians said, we're going to keep you alive, they were having Thanksgiving celebrations in the Bible for the God who was worthy of giving thanks. You know, every once in a while in your life, you know what you need to do when you're having a really hard time? When things aren't going well? When you're waiting on a while, on that promise for a while, anybody ever had to wait a while to get the promise? Anybody? I'm the only one? Anybody ever had to wait? Okay. You know what you need to do sometimes while you're waiting? Has, but, but has he answered other prayers in your life? Yeah, sometimes we get so focused on the one that hasn't happened, we forget the ones that have. You know, you, you, you got 10 kids and nine are saved, but one's a prodigal, you forget about the nine saved. Of course, none of you have 10 kids, but you, you forget about the nine that are serving God and all you can think about is the one lost. Come on, you, you understand what I'm saying? God's healed you 14 times and right now you're having to stand and believe for one. Come on, anybody with me? So while you're believing, you know what? You need to invite some people over who got the spirit of comeback. Don't get around the complainers. Don't call in the whiners. Don't call the blues brothers in. See, 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 don't, don't, don't bring in the haters. Don't bring in the doubters. Don't bring in God hasn't done anything. Don't bring in the people whose favorite song is what have you done for me lately. Bring some people in who will never forget what he's done and who he is and how faithful he is and just start talking about I'm thankful. Just say, God, I remember the day you saved me. Thank you, God. I remember the time you healed me. Thank you, God. And if you're believing for your son or daughter to get saved, invite somebody over whose son or daughter has already gotten saved and instead of being jealous because God answered there if you thank God for someone else's blessing God will bring that blessing back on your life just start throwing a comeback party we need to be more thankful Christians walk around you go to work and you look the same as every other sad sack at work I preach sometimes on Sunday, and, and, and not here, let, let me change that. There's some places I go preach, and, and if you don't have faith, the faces will kill you. They call it praise and worship, but it looks like whining and misery. You understand what I'm saying, you know. And so we need to have a comeback party. We need, you don't have to wait till the fourth Thursday of, of November, just whenever you get ready. You need to call some people over and say, we're just going to thank God tonight. You, you, if it's getting bad at work, get two or three of the Christians going to break room and, and just get together and say, let's start thanking God for some good things. You know, I know your boss is a tyrant or you own the company and the employees are lazy, but what you need to do is get somebody in there and say, aren't you thankful we've got a job today? Aren't you thankful that we're healthy today? Aren't you thankful God hears us? Aren't you thankful that God is blessing North Alabama? Come on. Aren't you thankful that the economy is on the upswing? Some people people all they see is the glass half empty and some people see glory to God we've got room for God to fill the glass up we just need to be thankful so watch this so so what does Mary do I, I, I love this so she she opens up this expensive perfume and she pours it here it says she poured it on Jesus feet and wiped his feet with her hair and Matthew it says she poured it on his head so she <laughs> she just poured it all over him and the Bible says this act of thanksgiving was like a fragrance that filled the whole house see you can shift the atmosphere if you just start thanking God just shifts the atmosphere. Do, do you know it will stop the complainers in their tracks have you ever been in a situation where everybody's griping and somebody gives thanks and just uh, crickets? You don't have to say, I'm holier than you. You don't have to say, you heathen. You don't have to say, just start thanking God. I've been in places where, every, you know, and isn't it amazing how quickly people get negative? 
You know, I, I've been, I've, I've been at, a, in, at a restaurant, and everybody's having a good time. And one person says, you know, my food's cold. And then, Lord, somebody opened the floodgate. Well, I wasn't going to say anything, but so was mine. I think this food's overpriced here, too. You know, I don't think I'm going to come back again. I tell you, and, you know, you just want to be stingy. You've been looking for this. I'm not going to tip because of this. I'm not going to leave a tip. Because I don't like the food. And the server didn't smile at me. So I'm going to. So, but all that starts happening. And, and all you have to do, one person say, you know, I'm just so thankful that I have this meal tonight. And that God has blessed me. And it's just like. Arr. I mean, it'll just stop it. Try it. I promise you. You don't have to rebuke anybody. You don't have to. Just, just be thankful. And just start your own comeback celebration. It's amazing. The fragrance will start filling the room. Just start filling the room when you do. Now, but, but you need to understand something. Look at verse 4. But you need to recognize who doesn't like Thanksgiving. I'm going to help you. We're going to come back to this guy before the, the next week or two. But look at this. Verse 4. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, now you know he is, who was later to betray Jesus, objected. <laughs> Some people don't like Thanksgiving. It's because who their daddy is. Because they don't have the spirit of thanksgiving. Because they're not walking in the spirit. Because they're not moving where Jesus is moved. So, so look at this. I want you to get this. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? That sounds all right, doesn't it? Oh, he just loves the poor. He's compassionate about the poor. You know, Judas, I, he's not a bad guy. Well, just hold on. Hold on before you get in the flesh. It was worth a year's wages. See, some people, <laughs> some people count everything they give to God. <laughs> you understand? They want Jesus to bless them, but they're going to count every penny out. <laughs> don't, don't be, I'm, I'm going to try to help you. The offering's over. Just relax. When some people pay their tithe, I mean, they divide it by 10%, not a penny more. I'm going to give $129.33. And that's it. Come on, don't shout me down. See, see, some people, the only question they ever ask in life is, how much did it cost? But some people get past that and they ask the most important question, how much was it worth? <laughs> see, when you decide what it's worth, it doesn't matter what it costs. See, Jesus looked at you and decided you were worth it and paid everything he had. See, see how much it costs is, is, is a non-thankful question. How much is it worth put you... Uh, any, does it, okay, it, I, I'm sorry. It, so, so, see, he, he just, some people count everything. They're not thankful. You know, okay. <sighs> Pastor Sawyer said, I'm not going to be blessed if I don't obey. So I'm going to obey. Ten percent. Give me ten percent. Get that money like you're going to break your arm. Uh. But you're up at Tennessee buying those lotto cards. Do you, take, do you take credit? Here's my debit card. How many can I buy? Be quiet, Martha. We're going to get rich. Come on, buy us. Oh, go over there to Tunica. Cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. cha-ching. Wear your arm out feeding that thing. They call it the one arm bandit. You wonder why he stole your money. What? Don't shout me down. <laughs> Some of you look like you need to get saved. I'm going to tell you right now. I mean, I've seen some looks, but anyway. She counted everything. But, but, but look, verse 6, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. <laughs> As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Wow. Look at the people that don't like Thanksgiving. Look at the spirit that objects to giving thanks. Look at the spirit that says that's too much worship. You need to calm down. I'm amazed in the church in America today, and I'm thankful I don't see this here, but the arrogant indifference to the presence of God. 
the arrogant indifference to the presence of God. Go to church and his presence would be an offense. If somebody really started thanking God and the fragrance began to spread in a room, those that want to control everything are offended and objectionable and intimidated by the release of the presence of God. And, and, and there's somebody named Mary who watched her brother die, who wept at his tomb for four days, who knew it was hopeless. But Jesus walked in and said, pull the stone away. Lazarus, come out of there. And she says, you may not like my thanksgiving it may be too loud it may be too expressive see if people don't know what you've been through they won't understand your breakthrough but if you know what he did and you're ready to give him thanks just go ahead and fill the house with your thanks just go ahead and say I love you I love you I love you I'm thankful I'm thankful I'm thankful I'm thankful I'm thankful We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't give up on me. You didn't leave me. You didn't forsake me. I didn't deserve it. You had mercy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A comeback party. See what happens if we lose the spirit of thanksgiving. We lose our faith. We lose our hope. We, we start looking at life from a skewed perspective. But then look at this. So Jesus says, verse 7, leave her alone. <laughs> I'd like Jesus to defend my side of things, don't you? <laughs> leave her alone. He says, look at this. It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. In a matter of days, he'd be crucified. In other words, he said, this is no coincidence. Watch this. God had to find someone with the spirit of thanksgiving. To do something, listen to this, that nobody else would recognize to do. She was willing to do something because of her giving thanks. God could use her to do what no one else could do before it was too late. Right? Because what? It was intended that she could say this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor. That doesn't mean Jesus doesn't love the poor. That's not at all what he's saying. Throughout scripture we're commanded to take care of the poor among us. But he said... This was the one opportunity for someone to prophetically anoint me for my burial. She says, he said, you'll not always have me. Matthew and Mark said that what she's done will be remembered from time on. We're talking about her today. See, I don't, I, I, I don't know who the nine ungrateful lepers were, but... I'm thankful for the one Samaritan. See that I, I, don't, I don't know who these other people are, but I'm thankful for Mary and the comeback party. But I want you to see, he said, this anointed me for my burial, okay? This, this was something that was significant. See, the, not only did the fragrance of Thanksgiving fill the room, but as she poured this year's worth of expensive, rich oil on his head, his body, down his back, his legs, his feet, what happened? He, his skin began to be permeated. God, he said, you've anointed me for my burial. Right? And so, listen, so the fragrance of thanksgiving and of this ointment and, and, and this perfume remained on him when everyone else had rejected him. See, he's in the garden praying and he rises. Judas comes and he's arrested and everybody leaves him. He's taken to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, by himself. Everyone had left him. But as they began to beat him that night, pow, as they hit his face and pulled out his beard, every time they hit him, every time they plucked his beard and pulled his hair, it released the fragrance of the anointing that Mary, the thankful one, had poured on him. 
And when he was all alone and he couldn't see anyone, he could smell the thanksgiving of those who had loved him for what he had done. And when they threw him down and began to rip the flesh off his back with the cat of nine tails, every time the blood was released, the fragrance was released. And Jesus knew, I'm not alone. I have someone who loves me and they're thankful. And when the nails ripped through his hands and his feet and he hung on the cross as they're hurling insults at him. He smelled the fragrance of those that were thankful for what he had done. And I want to be one of those when the world rejects him, when the church leaves him, when those that have healed walk away from him. I want to be one that my thanksgiving blesses him and says, thank you, God. We didn't forget you, Jesus. We love you. We're with you. I want to stay with him when everyone else rejects him. Why? Because the fragrance of giving thanks releases when Jesus has been rejected by everyone else. See, there, there, there's so much more. I think that I probably want to stop right there. I want to call uh, our praise and worship team forward because you see, the question again is, who came back? Who came back? Mary came back and lavished thanksgiving on him. The one leper came back and lavished thanksgiving on him. You see, it, it, the, the promise that is there, the, the victory that is there. We, we, we're, we'll, we'll step into it next week. But do you remember the little lady who was healed of the issue of blood? Do you know the Bible? I always said, as I began to study this language in the original text, it, it, there's a verse we'll look at next week. And it says that, that uh, when, when Jesus said, who touched me? It says, and when she came to him, <laughs> the, the language is that of she had started to leave. She was afraid. She knew she was healed, but she started to slip away. And Jesus said, who touched me? And the Bible says she turned and she came back to him and fell at his feet like the leper, like Mary, and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. What does Jesus say to the thankful person? Not only do you receive something in that moment, you, you receive life. You receive goodness. You receive favor. Your fragrance invades the atmosphere. Your home begins to be invaded by gratitude. Your relationship with the Lord begins to be invaded by gratitude. Why? Because the spirit of thanksgiving, the spirit of thanksgiving. I want you to stand with me, everyone, please. It's early on Calvary time. Come on, don't get in a hurry. Just want you to stand with me right now. Would you come? Would you stand? Would you stand, guys? Please come. How many are thankful? That Jesus came and walked on the borders of your life when others had rejected you. How many understand what I'm saying? When you, you had no right, all you could plead was mercy, mercy, mercy. See, today, we as a church family need to begin to thank God. We need to thank him. Is anybody thankful today? Is anyone recognizing? You know, I will thank him for Miss Betty's healing from cancer. See, I'm, 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 I'm standing. The Bible says if you ask, you shall receive. If you seek, you're going to find. If you knock, the door is going to be open unto you. And see, I've been asking and seeking and knocking for Phoenix complete healing in her body, like all of you have with us. And, 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 and it's coming, but it hasn't all come yet. And every day, I just tell the Lord, see, I'm past the asking stage. I'm past the seeking stage. I just go, sometimes he knows. I, I just go up to the, while I'm praying, sometimes I just go up to one of the walls in my house. And I say, Jesus, I'm still knocking. I'm still knocking. I'm still knocking. I'm still knocking. I'm not going away. I'm not giving up. I'm not forgetting. I'm knocking, 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 knocking. I know you hear me. I know you said it. I'm knocking. I'm knocking. I'm knocking. See, and so well, somebody says, well, Miss Betty got here. What about Phoenix? Oh, I'm going to thank God. 
because come on listen to me <laughs> she didn't get Phoenix healing like God can only give one every once in a while no that just reminds me while I'm moving God is who he says he is and God will do what he said so I'm going to rejoice when you rejoice and if you weep I'll come cry with you but we won't give up we're going to cry while we're walking to the next victory in our life we're just going to give thanks God is going to do what he said 